Hi there, I'm Sandy Alnock. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. At least I hope you're coming back because you saw part one of this video because this is part two. Now in part one, we talked about perspective and adding paths and roadways into a landscape in a way that doesn't make them feel like a funhouse addition into the landscape. And today I want to show you a more direct example. We just looked at photographs before and this time I'll do a little drawing. I already have planned out a drawing with a fox and the fox is going to be a straight on side view, which means the camera is right down at ground level. So we're looking at that fox without seeing any of the top of it, we're not looking from above, we're not looking from below, we're just looking a straight on side view. And the reason I chose that is because a lot of my followers here on YouTube are people who use rubber stamps and rubber stamps generally are straight on side views of anything. They don't actually do any perspective in those kinds of drawings for stamps. So we're gonna just tackle a straight on side view from ground level. Let's get started, shall we? So I'm going to start by quickly sketching in the subject for this particular drawing. And this is a fox. I've found a photo on Paint My Photo. I'll link to that over on my blog if you want to go try it yourself. I sketched it in pencil first, and then I'm adding some water-based marker. These are the Faber-Castell markers. Absolutely love these. They're highly pigmented. They go on you know, really nice and juicy. And they also have two different tips on these markers. One is a bullet nib, not a super small bullet nib, and then a brush nib. And both nibs work just great. And once you put the color down, you can then use water on a brush and start to move it. And then it turns into watercolor. Now there's other brands of water-based markers. These just happen to be my favorite. One reason is because they are entirely light fast and a lot of the crafty ones will fade in time. These stay nice and pigmented even when you start working with them with water and they aren't gonna fade on you the way that less expensive ones do. The color numbers for these are the same as the color numbers in their colored pencil sets, their watercolor pencil sets. Like they just have the same color system across everything, which is really helpful if you learn one color system, it's real easy to transfer into another one of their brand products that they make. So learn, learn the colors one time and you don't have to think about that again. And you can always find the color that matches if you have a particular colored pencil that you like, you know how to find that in uh, the markers, but there just are not as many of the markers as there are in the colored pencils. For details, I'm just using a micron pen to put in a little bit more of that. And the reason that I chose this image, as I said in the intro, is because I wanted one that was gonna have a figure of some kind down at ground level. So you're not seeing the top of the head of the fox, you're not seeing anything strange where you're looking up at him, you're just seeing him straight on from the side from down at his level. And that's very traditional for stamps. Like if you're somebody who uses rubber stamps, most of the figures that you are going to be coloring, whether they're animals or little people, they're going to be at eye level because they don't tend to get into you know, looking down at something from above where you can get into more interesting types of landscapes and putting different perspective in there. But a lot of that is because, you know, the illustrators who work on rubber stamps are not people who are going to be experienced in general with very high end, you know, fancy perspective on an animal. That's just, that's just not the kind of people that are going to be interested in making stamps so they do stay really simple so that pretty much everybody can color them in. I'm of course drawing my own, putting in a lot of detail with different layers of markers, more pencil, or more of the micron pen, that sort of thing to get it the way that I want it. Now I sketched in some birch trees. I'm gonna follow the pencil by just throwing in some sketchy lines for the birch tree bark and a couple of the branches 
with the marker and then I'll switch to a brush. With these markers, they tend to remain pliable for a little bit longer than some other brands. So some of the crafty brands will end up drying more permanently and you're not able to move them around. And also I'm able to use cold press, you know, good cold press paper with these markers. With a lot of those kinds of crafty markers, you'll want to use something more like a Canson XL where there's more slippage on the surface so that the marker actually moves because they tend to kind of get stuck on cotton paper like this. But these markers do really well on it. And that means I can get really beautiful watercolor edges when I melt out all of that ink from the, or the, the paint, the color, the whatever it is, the pigment in the pens, I can get really beautiful edges on it because I'm using good paper. So I'm gonna just give them a little bit more detail using the Micron pen. And to add leaves, I thought, you know, we're heading toward fall, we're not there yet, but I thought I'd make these into kind of a half fall, half summer kind of tree. So as if they're going to start changing color anytime because I'm waiting for fall. I love fall and the colors that it brings. So for the top of the tree, just a few dots of color, both in greens and browns, and then a nice big juicy wet brush to turn them into very loose watercolor, leaving some of the dots showing. And the same thing for the greens at the base of the tree. But notice that I still have a picture that has one plane in it. There's just foreground with both the fox and these trees. And you want to add something else in the background. Now, finding out where you're going to put your horizon line, and this is not to say we have to do like crazy math to figure this out, but when you're inventing it, where do you put that horizon? If you were looking at a lake behind this creature, where would the end of the lake potentially be? This is kind of high. You could get away with putting a road in here. I wouldn't put a straight road, but look how much of the picture is taken up by this road. In addition to which, your horizon line is way higher than where you're sitting looking at this fox because we are down at his level. We are looking at it from a low perspective. And if you take a piece of acetate like I've done here, and on one side I have a line in a permanent Sharpie marker so that that horizon line's already there, and then use a water-based marker for the rest, you can keep trying alternate scenarios. So here I'm gonna move it down some. That feels much better already. It feels like a closer, more intimate scene. A straight road, still not feeling it. It almost feels like it's deliberately trying to surround the fox in some weird way. So when I put in a curvy road, let me try it from one side or the other first. And I mean, this is a great way to just play around with what's gonna look right for your picture. That road is taking up much less real estate and I have a better chance of keeping my focus on the main feature instead of on that road and all that craziness. When you're aligning where you wanna have your horizon line, I would stay away from the facial features because sometimes that can look a little weird. So moving your horizon line up or down, generally I always stay away from dead center. I always try to move the horizon line somewhere else and here I've lowered it considerably, and it's still gonna get nice and wide in the front and really skinny in the background, which starts to really diminish that road even further, which is great. But let me try it one more and see if I can go down another notch and does the, which one feels better and does this one even work? So I'm going to uh, put it down here, right like middle of the body, and add in a road that's skinny in the distance and wide up front, you know, imagining that the road goes behind those bushes, those little plants. And that feels very nice to me. I like how little real estate this will take up. It really helps me to feel like my fox is, I'm, I'm looking at him from down low and I'm gonna change up the straight horizon and make it a little bit of a softer curve. So it feels like there's maybe some hills out there. And then sketching it in lightly in pencil. Now you can kind of adjust that further. You can play with it more on the acetate to get it the shape that you want. But I'm gonna make it really skinny in the distance and then it's going to get wider as it moves to the front. 
I was debating whether it would just kind of go over to the left and then realized I wanted it to curve around a little bit more as well. But that strip is going to be the only part with more dense color in it as I start adding the other elements to the background because all of that's going to help build to having a soft scene in the background and then the focus is on the fox itself. I'm making more trees, more of these same birch trees in the background, but I'm using less ink because I'm going to be trying to make them smaller trees and lighter trees. And so I'm not going to use any micron pen back there. I'm just going to use water and the markers themselves. And the more water you use, the more you can water it out. And if you want it even lighter, because you've gotten too dark with it, you can just use a baby wipe and dab some off. And especially once it's wet, you can lift off quite a bit if you need to. But notice the scale of these has shrunk drastically. Because if you make the trees in the background the same scale as those big trees in the foreground, you're going to end up with them all looking like they're the same. And you want them to look like smaller versions. I've scribbled some color onto the acetate, because that's another nice thing that you can do with water-based markers. Just make yourself a little mini palette out of the colors. And I'm just using the same colors that I've already got in my scene. And I'm do the same thing with a different green so I can paint the grasses in there. Now I'm starting with a path that has a really hard edge to it. It almost looks like a, a path that you might use for, um, say, uh, Dorothy going to see the witch. So I broke up the path, the edges of it, by bringing in more greens. And then I added some color to the path and let the color kind of blend in with the greens so it felt more like a natural path that animals have carved into the hillside. And all of this is happening because I understood the perspective that I was trying to communicate, where that small strip at the bottom indicates that we're looking at something that's very far in the distance. Those trees are way back there, but because of paying attention to the perspective, I can create a scene that also keeps my fox as the main thing instead of making the scene take over. I hope this video helped you to understand how you can add a more realistic path or roadway into your artwork. And if it was helpful, do me a favor and leave me a comment and go share it with a friend because if these two videos get a fair decent number of views, then I'll do more like them, maybe addressing trees, addressing clouds, addressing water, all of these landscape elements, but in perspective so that your drawings and your paintings can become more realistic. All right. Thank you so much. Get out there and create something every day. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.